Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak today about the impact of policy on space weather services and science. Um, this is a topic I have been involved in for, since I graduated from Michigan about 15 years ago. And so I've encountered many of these issues. And in many ways, this is going to follow my journey in the field. So before we start, just want to make sure everybody has an understanding of, you know, what is space weather? Although I think in this crowd, you probably pretty much know this. Um, in many ways, probably better than I do. Um, so there are three different storms that um, we, we, um, we predict, we monitor, we watch at, at NOAA. And so just want to go through them. First is the uh, radio blackout um, storms, or the R scale. This is uh, electromagnetic emissions uh, coming from a solar flare. So basically, it's, it's photons or light traveling towards Earth. And they can get here in about eight minutes. Um, and then they can last several minutes to hours. Then um, we have uh, solar radiation storms, a little bit heavier, protons, electrons, charged particle radiation. They could take tens of minutes to several hours to reach us. And then we have magnetized uh, plasma, or coronal mass ejections, ejections, CMEs, as you may know them. So burst of plasma um, hurling at the Earth can take about 16 hours to several, several days to reach the Earth. And this is our geomagnetic storm G scale. So as you know, it's 93 million miles um, from the sun to the Earth. So imagine how difficult it must be to try to predict if something coming off the sun is going to hit this little point in space where we are on Earth. OK. And so you may have you're probably familiar with the uh, variety of uh, space weather impacts, but just to go over them. Um, you know, as our technology has advanced, we have a lot more um, our vulnerability to space weather has increased. There are impacts on GPS. They can space weather can cause signal delays, distortions, even disrupt signal transmission. On aviation, it can interfere with HF radio communication or navigation in flight, takeoff or landing. Electric power, it can cause overheating of the transformers. Uh, satellites can um, cause electronic discharging or satellite anomalies. And then for manned spaceflight or deep space missions, radiation is a problem. So I like this, um, this chart right here. This is an old chart. Hopefully you can see it from, um, from NOAA. And it was about the time when I, um, I started. I started the American Meteorological Society. And NOAA put out this chart, uh, this is so back in, say, early 2000s, growth of space weather customers. And back by then, it was the, it was the Space Environment Center. And so NOAA has been providing space weather services since the 1940s. Um, NOAA was created in 1970. Before that, it was ESSA, the Environmental Science Service Administration. And so as technology developed, so did, we, so did the need for understanding the impacts. And so if you look early on, 1940s, it was shortwave radio propagation, ionospheric rocket experiments, balloon rocket experiments. Then in the 70s, there was um, the Omega, the Lorentz navigation systems, uh, radiation hazards to astronauts were of concern, long, learned tel long line telephone systems, power distribution, um, the 1990s, again, GPS navigation, weather satellite operations. Um, so this takes you about to the early 2000s. So you could see this growth in customers that were interested in having space weather information. Um, However, widespread that awareness of space weather was, not, was still very limited. Not many people knew about it, what it was. Um, it wasn't even really called space weather during this time. And in addition, there was a very limited connection with policy. OK, so what I'd like to now do is take a closer look at what have been some of the major impacts. Um, what did we know about space weather at the turn of the 21st century? So this is probably the most famous one everyone's familiar with, the, 19, the 1859 Carrington event. Um, a large um, storm caused um, havoc on the telegraph system. Um, uh, let's see, discharges uh, shocked the telegraph operators. It actually set the de telegraph paper on fire. Um, here's a quote from uh, the New Orleans paper. All, all, our, all our exchanges from the northern coast of the island of Cuba gave glowing descriptions of the aurora borealis, as bright in the tropics as in the northern zones. So while people were used to seeing aurora up in the northern states, I mean, imagine what it was like when they woke up and they saw this in Cuba. So this was a huge event. A lot of the community keeps referring to this event, saying, you know, what if we have 
this huge storm today, what would be the impact? Because now we have a lot more technology that would be impacted by space weather. Another major storm I wanted to talk about was the 1921 um, geomagnetic storm. And so the famous example here is that the New York Central Signal System um, caught on fire. Um, reading a little bit here from the New York Times, it says, um, at 7.04 o'clock yesterday morning, when the entire signal and switching system of the New York Central Railroad below 125th Street was put out of operation, followed by a fire in the control tower. So again, this is 1921, and we know that, you know, there, that the sun was impacting the power you know, system. Um, okay. So, and then another uh, famous event was the 1989 um, Hydro-Quebec storm. It caused the collapse, uh, the, sorry, the 1989 geomagnetic storm caused the collapse of the Hydro-Quebec electricity transmission system. Six million people went without power for nine hours. Imagine that, again, today, what, how, how that would feel. Um, and the cost to customers was estimated in the hundreds of millions of dollars. There were damages to various U.S. assets. For example, the Salem nuclear power plant transformer damage was estimated at 12 million. We also knew that there's been various satellite anomalies through the, throughout the years. Here I just document some of them. Um, in uh, 1994, the Intelsat, the um, Anik, um, E1 were recovered in a few hours. In 1997, Telstar, total loss, the insurance payout was 132 million. 98, Galaxy 4, total loss, insurance payout 165 million. And then in 2003, <coughs> during the, what was known as the Halloween storms, 47 satellites reported malfunctions. Uh, the Midori 2 was a total loss at 60, 640 million. So uh, we call these satellite anomalies. They occur during space weather disturbances. Typically, it's really hard to get information from the satellite industry on, um, you know, was there an impact due to space weather? But we, we do collect some of that information. So <clears throat> anyways, okay, so great. We, we all know that those are the traditional, you know, um, impacts from, the, from history. But then, okay, so now we're getting, um, again, towards the late 1990s, and um, a series of policy decisions have then changed the urgency and the need for space weather services and understanding the underlying science. So when the Cold War ended, um, Russia then opened up its airspace. So before then, um, airlines were not allowed to fly in Russian airspace. So um, uh, in, in October 2000, NAV Canada and the FAA, they did a feasibility study. And they concluded that the shorter polar routes would actually um, would offer significant time savings. So if there's time savings, that means less fuel. They, um, they're not having to make stopovers. They could, um, they could save money. So that was the end result there. Um, the, you see this uh, picture right here. It shows you 1960s to 1990s what the, what the routes were. Again, they had, to, they had to avoid the Russian airspace. And in the 2000s, they could now go over the poles. OK. So however, now, when, you, when a flight is going over the pole, um, so typically, okay, in North America, Asia, they'll use VHF or SATCOM. But once they get to the higher latitudes, um, 82 degrees north, um, the H, um, sat sorry, satellite communication is not available. But HF or Iridium uh, can be used. Iridium is not, it's not equipped on most airlines, so they have to rely on HF communications. Um, because of solar radiation storms, we can lose HF radio communications above 82 degrees. And according to FAA regulations, they need to be in contact with air traffic control at all times. So you can see here that you know, the need developing for really understanding um, when you know, space weather activity is occurring. So what we did, and I did some of this while I was at AMS, was to try to understand, you know, working with NOAA and other agencies and the, uh, the community really is, you know, what, what were the customer needs for aviation? So we held a series of workshops and a lot of one-on-one -on -one discussions, and they started to emerge. First was um, the industry wanted to know, you know, we need to improve the communication of space weather information. How, who was going to communicate it to the airlines? How was it going to be communicated? Um, standardization of um, regulations and information. Um, were all the airlines going to take the same kind of action? Did they know at what, um, 
you know, what level s scale did they know when to change their operations? We they really want a standardization across the industry. Education and training. Um, many in, at this time was maybe one or two folks in an airline even knew about space weather. So they were really concerned about how do we educate others in the airlines? How do we um, educate their managers? So then they could take appropriate action. And then cost-benefit analysis. Again, what, is the, what would be the benefit to um, not taking that flight? I mean, it's because of cost to the airlines, but also um, and there, could be, um, you know, there could be an operational cost, there could be a health cost as well, so. Okay. Um, this is another interesting chart I wanted to show you. This shows um, the number of polar flights and how they have dramatically increased in, since the airspace has opened up. So, on the, um, the y-axis, it's what they call number of movements. In the year 2000, there were about a f only 402 movements. And you can see in 2014, last year, there were close to 13,000 movements. That is just drastically increased. Um, 2015 right now, you see 11,000. Not sure if anybody knows why it's only 11,000, but it's only because we only have nine months worth of data. So we can expect that, I mean, it could probably be close to 14,000 when we, we'll see the results at the end of the year. So here's another policy change I'd like to, um, to offer here, is that in, um, in May 2000, at the direction of uh, President Bill Clinton, the US government continued its use of selective availability in order to make GPS more responsive to civil and commercial users worldwide. Um, so basically, um, the, so the government was degrading the, the GPS signal. Now we didn't have that anymore. So when, we, so when selective availability was on, the accuracy would have been 100 meters. With it off, it's about 15 meters. And then using the wide area augmentation system from the FAA, we got it down to three meters. So now with having that level of accuracy, you can just imagine that um, many of the industries were now excited about the opportunity that this could you know, lead to. Um, this is a chart from the um, you know, U.S. Space Command, and it shows um, instantaneous error versus time of day. And you can see clearly where um, selective availability um, was turned off, because all of a sudden the error went down drastically, basically like flatlined. So great. So now people were really curious, okay, so what's going to be, um, what's, what's our vulnerability now? So GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems, basically GPSs across, across the world, um, we're, now being, we're now being used uh, many different, by many different applications. Um, almost everything that you probably use has some kind of, uh, uses some kind of GPS application. So the satellite operations, communications, um, the fishing and boating industry, the oil exploration industry. So like in the Gulf of Mexico, there are all these pipelines. They are making, they need to know exactly where they're going to be drilling. And so it's really important that they understand is space weather going to be impacting, um, you know, their navigation. Um, it, if they have to halt, I mean, it can cost them a million dollars a day to um, have to halt operations. Um, another one is precision agriculture. You might have heard of that. Nowadays, um, uh, Farmers aren't actually sitting on the tractors. They're now being run by themselves uh, by GPS. So they're able to precisely uh, put fertilizer down, uh, put seeds down. So it's making it much more effective um, in a cost savings for, for that industry. So again, so being aware of this, you know, we brought again, again, uh, to get the customer workshops, one-on-one -on -one interactions to try to understand. So what was their need? Now that they know that space weather can impact GPS, what were they concerned about? And the first thing is people still really wanted to understand what is the vulnerability of GPS technologies and services to space weather. Also, they wanted to then understand the consequences of space weather impacts on GPS stakeholders and customers. And then how do we build resilience to this? So if it's going to happen, what can we do? Uh, what kind of backup systems can be provided to um, prevent this? Okay. A third policy change I want to mention is the deregulation of the electric grid. So in the 1990s, um, FERC mandated the unbundling of the sales um, services from transportation services, providing customers with full choice of providers and opening markets to competition. So before it would be the power plants going to the local electric company, then it would go to you. After the deregulation, it would be power plants, there would now be electric suppliers, local electric company, and then it would go to you. 
So what does that mean? Now we have this massive interconnectedness, different grids, different regional grids, and so a little bit of a mess, right? So you see this, this picture here. Um, and so again, we're trying to understand the customer needs. You know, what, so what is the vulnerability of the electric power grid? We're trying to get to that. And then also, what are the regional impacts? Um, you can see here on the East Coast, there's a lot of uh, grids interconnected. And what's going to be the impact if, you know, we get a big geomagnetic storm, one part goes down, how is it going to, is it going to take down the rest of it? Um, and also, a big concern is, how is it going to come back up? How long is it going to take if something goes, if part of the grid goes down, for it to come back up? That's uh, a big concern. Um, I wanted to show you this um, diagram. So this is from um, Homeland Security. Uh, this also is in the severe, the NRC severe space weather um, events uh, report. And so it's, it's a little complicated, but what's nice about it, it just shows you all of the um, interdependencies. So we have electric power, but okay, great, if the power goes out, that means it impacts transportation, it impacts emergency services, government services, oil and gas, communications, water, banking and finance. Basically, all of our social, social structure is impacted if the power goes out. And again, for long periods of time. So, um, we're, you know, working with the industry to get a better understanding of, um, of what is it that they need. Okay. So those were some of the, as I call them, like policy drivers that I think sort of shifted how we, what we were thinking about space weather, how we were dealing with customers, user needs. Now, what I'd also like to talk about is some other drivers. So one other thing of note is the establishment of the National Space Weather Program. So in the mid-1990s, there was um, a real need. You know, the different agencies saw the need that they needed to better coordinate um, space weather research operations, activities. This, they put out their first strategic plan in August 1995. And you can, you can find these in, online. And sometimes it's interesting to go back and see you know, what is it that they proposed back then. Um, but what I did want to read, which I think was interesting, their overarching goal back in 1995 was to achieve within the next 10 years an active synergistic interagency system to provide timely, accurate, and reliable space environment observations, specifications, and forecasts. So I think, you know, I think we did a, you know, the community did a pretty good job with that. Um, and then, you know, there came a series of other strategic plans and other implementation plans, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so again, it's, it, agencies came together, said we needed to do something um, to help, you know, better coordinate across the government. I also want to point out, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Pasteur's Quadrant, but here on the y-axis, you know, if we look at what's the quest for fundamental understanding versus consideration of use. If, um, you know, we think about research, if we're saying, you know, we're really, we're highly interested in, you know, fundamental research, we don't care about its use, that's pure basic um, knowledge, the Bohr quadrant. If we're interested in, you know, high consideration of use but low quest for fundamental understanding, that's applied research. Then there's the use-inspired basic research, which is high consideration of use, high quest for knowledge. And so really that's where, you know, a lot of people at the time were talking about, that's where space weather was fitting in now. Um, what might have been like a space physics, um, magnetospheric physics, you know, these different areas. It was now realizing that we could do, you could do this research and actually it would be applied to society. It had some societal benefit now. So another driver was that um, Congress started to take notice as well. So on October 30th, 2003, there was a hearing before the House Subcommittee on Environment, Technology, and Standards. Um, part of this was because um, uh, Congress was considering zero zeroing out um, NOAA's um, space weather budget. And so they said, okay, you know, what is, why is NOAA doing space weather? You know, so they do weather. So anyways, they called this hearing. And I just wanted to show you the three main questions they discussed. You know, because just thinking about, you know, would we even have something like this today? You know, why do we need to understand and forecast space weather events? What unique capabilities and expertise does NOAA's, and at the time was Space Environment Center, uh, provide? To what extent could the Air Force or NASA perform these duties? You know, again, it's thought NASA does space, so why, you know, why shouldn't NASA be doing this? <clears throat> and then what are the implications of the closure or reduced activities of NOAA's SEC to the government and private sector? So if we closed down NOAA, they were no longer providing these uh, services to the, to the industry, what would happen? 
So there was a whole collection of people that came out, gave testimony, wrote letters. We had our customers and users there basically talking about the, the need for um, NOAA to provide, you know, these forecast services. So, you know, it's, it, it did save the budget. NOAA did not go away with space weather. Um, okay. Another driver that I've sort of witnessed as well is better alignment with the weather community. So as I mentioned, I, I, when I left Michigan, I went to the AMS um, policy program, and at the time there was very limited awareness of space weather in AMS. But there were a few people there that started to see the connections because, you know, we forecast terrestrial weather, okay, we're forecasting space weather, there's a connection there. Um, so one of the things, um, several of us got together and we uh, started, um, put together a space weather committee, and we uh, organized the first space weather conference, and that was back in 2003. And when we held that, there were about 50 people in the room, and we looked around, and everybody basically knew each other. Basically, you know, space physicists, and so space weather scientists. Um, I should say, we've been holding that annually every year, and now we get like, especially when it opens up, standing room only, like we can get like easily 200 people in the room. So we've come a long way through, through growing that at AMS. We've also put out policy statements on space weather. Um, and then, um, a couple of things. So, Space weather activities, you know, as they became, we realized, okay, we can, you know, we can forecast space weather. We, there's some predictive capability there. Um, NOAA decided to move that from the NOAA Research Line office to the Operational um, Weather Service. And that happened only in 2005. So only 10 years ago did um, that, you know, space weather activities move into weather service. And then um, in 2007, realized, you know, Space Environment Center didn't, that wasn't the best name anymore. We were, doing pre, we were doing prediction. So now they changed the name to Space Weather Prediction Center to better reflect um, what NOAA was doing. <coughs> okay. Another driver is the growing space weather enterprise. Um, this really is a true partnership between the three sectors, the government, private sector, and academia. And, um, and again, I remember in the early 2000s, I'd go to some of these meetings with um, folks from the private sector, and there was a lot of discussion about, you know, line in the sand, what should the, what should the government do, what should the private sector do? And um, that has come a long way. Um, there's now a lot of meetings that we hold and, and discussions, but we're now we're having more um, I think just fruitful, productive discussions about how we can work together, how we can actually help each other all succeed. Because, and then we really, we, we do want, um, a commercial, you know, industry. We want, well, we want that to grow. Um, we want universities, you know, to, to grow. We want basically all to help each other out. We shouldn't necessarily be replicating what we each other are doing, but really helping each other grow, to grow what this uh, space weather en enterprise should be. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Another driver is emergency preparedness and response. So in about um, 2010, um, uh, FEMA, a lot more interested, a lot more aware about space weather, they came out to Boulder and they held a workshop on, um, you know, let's look at how geomagnetic storms can impact um, the grid. And so that really kicked off a series of events at, you know, at FEMA, at DHS, about how um, they wanted to get more involved and how can we prepare the nation for space weather. Um, it even trickled down to the state and local level. When I started at NOAA about um, four and a half years ago, I um, went out to some of the, I met with some of the local emergency managers. They were very interested in learning about how they can apply this into their own emergency preparedness plans. So you can see how sp space weather um, preparedness is now spreading. <coughs> then the White House interest starts to grow. So we're making a lot of progress here now. Um, you know, working with White House, working with Congress, different government leadership, we're coordinating on ways to move forward. Um, so I want to just point out a few other events that happened in 2011, which I think helped, um, you know, advance things as well. Um, in February 2011, there was this Secure High Voltage Infrastructure for Electricity from Lethal Damage Act, or what's known as the SHIELD Act. Uh, really more focused on um, EMPs, but, um, but space weather um, was looked at as well. Um, in February 2011, there was a meeting at the White House with national security staff and OSTP, Office of, that's the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And then in March 2011, um, in the New York Times, there was an op-ed by um, Dr. John Holdren, the um, President's Science Advisor, and then um, Beddington, the UK Science Advisor. And, um, and what they, they said, what is key now is to identify, test, and begin to deploy 
the best array of protective measures pra uh, practical in parallel with reaching out to the public with information explaining the risks and remedies. So now it was like, all right, this is getting some pretty high level attention in the government. There was an electric infrastructure security summit in the Capitol building. So we saw that awareness was now growing um, among different policymakers. So that was really exciting. Um, again, some more um, kind of activities in Congress. There was the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act, the NASA Authorization Act of 2010, which gave OSTP the role uh, to um, improve the nation's ability to prepare for space weather storms. Uh, there was a U.S. regulatory action. FERC um, created some reliability standards. Space weather was now in the Strategic National Risk Assessment. Uh, uh, FEMA had a federal interagency response plan that includes space weather. And then internationally, the, the uh, World Meteorological Organization created the Interprogram Coordination Team on Space Weather. And then FAA and the uh, UN International Civil Avi Aviation Organization were now looking at how to um, set standards for um, uh, aviation and using space weather information. And then, uh, and then there were NATO space weather teams developed as well. So you can see how I'm sort of building up to this. And then now we got, again, we got the attention of the Executive Office of the President. Um, at this time, OSTP was now organizing a um, space weather interagency working group, basically sitting around with different um, uh, agencies discussing, okay, what, what's the issue? What's the impact on the grid? What do we know about the science? What's the, uh, the, what's the worst case scenario? Um, and then um, in 2000, uh, 20, sorry, 2013, they released the Space Weather Observing Systems Report discussing current capabilities and requirements for the next decade. And then there was a series of White House and UK cabinet office discussions talking about, okay, how can we work together? The UK also can experience similar kind of impacts. What can we learn from each other? How could we um, have some sort of consistency in, in the way we're doing things? So what, was, what they knew is they needed a cohesive all of government strategy that was necessary to mitigate and respond and recover from space weather storms. Okay. So I wanted to give you all that background. And again, I've, you know, I sort of followed that along, been somewhat involved in, in that um, as, as I went along. So now I want to talk about, so where are we today? OK. So last year, this month, um, the Space Weather Operations Research and Mitigation Task Force was established, or what's known as SWARM. And uh, government was tasked to develop a national space weather strategy and a space weather action plan. In that plan, there were, uh, were, there were to be six high-level goals um, to sort of go through. First was establishing benchmarks for space weather events. Two, enhancing response and recovering capabilities. Three, improving protection and mitigation efforts. Four, improving the assessment, modeling, and prediction of cr impacts on critical infrastructure. Five, improving space weather services through advancing understanding and forecasting. That was going to include research to operations, operations to research, and observations and then increasing international cooperation. I just want to mention when we first started to do this, um, you know, we started, after the benchmarks, we started with uh, space weather services and the, the, you know, the research and services. And we realized, you know, actually, no, let's hear from the users first. Let's put forward first, what does the um, emergency response community need? And then we'll talk about, okay, how we can help fulfill that. So there was also a space weather action plan and that was to establish the process to implement the strategy. And so we were told the strategy must have an accompanying roadmap to be successful, and that this uh, plan will establish specific activities with implementation timelines, detailed actions, and specific agency assignments. So last week, and I actually took this picture myself, so this was, it was exciting that it actually we rolled, it was rolled out, OSTP rolled it out, the National Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan. So it's now available on, on the website, on OSTP's website. Um, if you haven't seen it, feel free to you know, download it, read it. Um, but now the agencies are tasked with actually having to implement this. Um, so the job is not done yet. <laughs> okay. So what is NOAA's role in all of this? Um, not sure if anyone's heard about how NOAA is trying to create a weather ready, ready nation. Basically, um, have, you know, building our resilience in the face of increasing vulnerability to space weather. So we're doing this overall for weather and climate, but we're all, again, space weather is part of NOAA and we're including space weather in this as well. 
And so as part of this, we need the critical observations, we need to, our improved forecasts, and we need partnerships. Again, we can't do this alone. So we need better information connected to key stakeholders and benchmarks for better decisions. So at, at NOAA, um, these are a few of the um, observations that we depend upon. Um, first is Discover. Many of you may be aware of that. Um, it's operationally dedicated. It was a replacement for the NASA ACE satellite. So really excited. That was launched uh, last, uh, well, in January. Um, hoping in, by the summer we can use it operationally, use the data operationally. It's still, in, we're, we're testing things out right now. Um, and then there's GOZAR, NOAA's next generation of geostationary operational environmental satellites. Um, provi providing continuity of existing measurements, updated imager, inclusion of hot, heavy ion measurements with a launch for next year. And then an operational chronograph. This is a really high priority um, for NOAA, for the community. Uh, we need um, to replace the, the NASA SOHO chronograph. Um, um, a request for information was issued in February 2014 for a Discover follow-on, and this combines the chronograph and in-situ um, mag plasma. So, um, again, so you could see we, we, we are doing what we can to get the observations that we need to do uh, the forecasts. So I want to talk just a little bit about modeling. So we're really looking at this as a sun-to-earth continuum. Um, we really depend on partnerships with the space weather research community. Um, so you could see we're modeling from the sun to the earth, or, or what we'd like to be doing. So uh, first I want to mention is the solar wind model, the, the uh, Enlil model. It's currently in operations. It, it came from academia. It was tested um, at NASA uh, Goddard, and then it was transitioned to operations at NOAA. So with, with Enlil, we're predicting the, um, we're doing model runs to see what a CME will arrive at Earth. So it's running on the supercomputers at NOAA. Um, next thing is the, and many of you are probably familiar with this, the University of Michigan uh, Space Weather Modeling Framework, the geospace model, that was, that's been selected to go into transition at, um, at SWPC. And so we're, work, we're working with, um, with you guys, and hopefully, I guess, it's aimed, I guess, for 2016 for operations. Um, another model we're looking at is the whole atmosphere model, and that's really extending the uh, NOAA weather model. Um, up into the ionosphere so we can connect the lower and upper atmosphere together. And then the idea also is to have an electric field model at the Earth's surface. And so this would be of, of, of you know, very important use to the electric power industry. Okay. So another thing I wanted to mention was um, the need for impact models and forecast, more forecast products. So in the strategy um, goal. We say that uh, critical infrastructure impact models will be should be operationalized to allow forecasts and not now cast the space weather effects. So we're looking at beyond the space weather phenomenology. Uh, think of this as similar to hurricane storm surge impact modeling. So it's not just the wind speed, it's the storm surge that does the impact. So thinking that way in terms of space weather. So there should be lots of opportunities for new products and services for both operational forecast centers, emergency managers. This is an area that um, you know, the commercial sector can get involved in and, and, and others as well. Okay. So, okay, great. So I sort of told you where we are today. Now we have the strategy. Just came out last week. Wonderful. Um, so you know, where are we now? We do have a better sense of the user needs. We have improved decision support now. Um, at the federal, state, and local governments, uh, we're contributing to um, development and implementation of preparedness and mitigation strategies. Um, with the power grid, we're providing support to the North American Electric Reliability Corporation on NOAA's products and, and uh, FERC to set standards for industry. And in aviation, we're providing FA and ICAO with subject matter expertise to set international standards. But there are still many evolving customer needs, so there's still a lot to be done. Um, in commercial space, you hear about space tourism. Uh, there's been some, you know, uh, test flights, and you know, soon I guess everyone will have their ticket to go up in space. And so, um, you know, they're concerned about the the, pa the health, um, the radiation impacts on passengers and crew. So that's uh, that's an area we need to um, need to be looking at. Um, evolving the national airspace. Um, again, GPS is going is going to just be more widespread than it is, is, uh, is even now. You know, there's. Um, uh, the next generation um, air transportation system is totally dependent on a GPS. Um, there's all kinds of drones that are being used nowadays. Again, people are buying things on the internet, you know, and, um, 
And what if it shows up at the wrong house instead of your house? You know what I mean? You'll be probably be pretty mad about that. So, um, and then um, Arctic exploration. Uh, um, as the ice is melting, it's creating more passageway for vessels to travel. And so they're going to they're gonna need a lot of help um, with uh, safe and efficient navigation, search and rescue, and exploration in the highly impacted region. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I wanted to just pose some questions here um, for, for you to think about and sort of where I think we are now in this future. Um, so I've talked about, you know, this sort of this growth and how we got the policymakers' attention. So how are we going to use that effectively? We got their attention. You know, and I think that's something that, you know, academia could help with. Um, you know, wh what, are we gonna, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna make space weather relevant, especially when we don't see activity all the time? And then how do we continue to grow the enterprise? As I said, we're working together with the sectors, uh, academia, private sector, uh, and government, but um, how can we better leverage what we, we're doing together to um, just improve um, services and research and operations? Also, um, you know, I started, I looked up, you know, I was trying to look up some of the international organizations. You know, we got the WMO, we got the um, International Council for Science, we got the UN Office of Outer S Space Affairs, we got the International Living with a Star, we got ICAO, we got International Space Environment Service, we got the UN International Committee on uh, GNSS. So we got all these different international committees and you might be involved with some of them and it's, how well are these being coordinated? You know, some of the same people are on them, maybe not, I mean, is that, is that good that we're on, we're on spread across so many different international organizations? Is there a, a better way to help leverage all of these collaborations? Okay. Another one. Oh, I hear some laughter. Okay. So um, <laughs> how do you maintain interest throughout the solar cycle? You know, we're getting towards solar minimum. And it's like, in some ways, we sold solar max. And we said, okay, it's coming. And you've got to be prepared. And then guess what happened? There was really no huge storm and then okay then we changed our tune and it's like oh but space weather can happen all the time and we have been saying that at NOAA all along that space weather happens every day but in um, but there's just been a lot of um, I don't know just a lot of voices that have been saying you know so focused on solar maximum and so now what do we do um, but we're trying to tell people a big storm could happen at any time it could happen in during solar minimum it's just that maybe not as frequent so um, some people are concerned about galactic cosmic rays and, and that, that those are more, um, feel the impact of more of, that, more of that, sorry, during solar minimum. So again, this is a question that I think, um, you know, academia could help as well. And then um, how to meet user needs. How do we continue to advance forecasting models to meet user needs? Great, we have this NLIL model, but it's like, you know, this operational model. We still need a, to do a lot more work in um, forecasting models. And again, a lot of the models are being developed in the universities. And so, you know, please continue doing what you're doing. And, um, and when it's ready, we you know, we're happy, you know, let's talk, let's work together, let's figure out as a community how to help transition those models into operations. And so just to remind you again, so there are these cha this changing customer base. We got more um, airlines, we got the commercial space, we have um, more applications of GPS, uh, power generation, uh, other emergency technology and applications. So as we I mean, experience maybe new customer bases, how are we gonna meet those challenges? How are we gonna meet their needs? So that's something we need to constant be, constantly be looking at. Um, another interesting one for me is um, how to engage social scientists. Um, how to attract you know, and engage economists, social scientists. I feel like there's not enough of them engaged in our community. I once asked an economist that question. He said, well, there's really no, mo there's no funding in that, you know, no funding to, do, to look at this. So I don't know. How, how do we, so is it not an interesting problem or is it just, I don't know. I, so again, I'm not, I'm not providing the answer to this. But um, the other interesting thing is when you, there's some reports out there that talk about economic impacts and it's like, you know, one to two trillion dollars. What does that mean? None of us really have a handle on trillion. Um, I think we need better, um, you know, estimates, better understanding of, you know, the economic impacts. So again, I just, I just throw that out because I think the whole community should be um, looking how to help with that. And then, um, and then I want to sort of end with this, you know, how to engage the public. Why should the public care and what can they do about it? 
Um, so this summer I spent a month at the Exploratorium Museum in San Francisco, gave a talk on space weather, and it was this great talk, and then at the end they said, well, you know, what can the public do? And I was just like, uh, you know, because I was like, well, you know, you can prepare just like you prepare for a, a winter storm, you know, when there's blackout, you know, you, you get extra water and you get extra food and the person's face was just like, you know, that's not exciting, you know what I mean? And it's like, but again, that's, that's our official line. That's what you should do to prepare. Um, how do we, so the challenge is, you know, we want to make people excited about space weather. We, you know, we want the media to, to, to understand, we want people to talk about it. We don't want to hype it up too much. So what's that balance between hyping it up, not hyping it up, I mean, and, you know, getting them excited about it, but yet not too excited that, you know, they can't do something about it. So I don't know that answer yet either. I think that, I think we need a lot more work. And again, I don't think that's just the government's job to do that. I think, um, again, the whole, you know, community should be helping out and thinking a lot more about that. So again, I pose that to, you know, to academia to see how, um, what your role could be in that. So I'm going to end with that. So um, thank you very much for letting me sort of walk through this journey, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll take any questions. Thanks. And so most people haven't thought of pollen as being a good uh, starter for cloud droplets because generally they're too large and they don't last in the atmosphere that long. But what we found is when pollen gets wet,